500 million years ago, animal life burst forth across the earth. Suddenly, the oceans teemed with a menagerie, both wondrous and bizarre. It's almost like a, a science fiction world. You just never know what you're going to find. Oh, perfect. Yes. Perfect. Who were these fantastic creatures? What triggered their sudden appearance? And what was their impact on Earth? So we're looking at sort of this dawn of animal life. These are the roots of our own world. From the mighty to the lowly, these unlikely heroes would alter the course of life on Earth. Some even transformed the climate of our planet, allowing it to nurture an ever-evolving web of life. We should remember that we depend very much on the diversity. When the clock of animal evolution began to turn, life on Earth seemed simple, sedentary, and peaceful. Then in a flash, everything changed. Over 500 million years ago, fantastic creatures sprang into being as though from nowhere. In geologic time, these animals appeared in the blink of an eye. For the evolution of life on our world, it was a singular, defining moment. Des Collins has dedicated his career to the pursuit of these ancient creatures. His quest carries him from the highest mountains to the most desolate deserts. But the challenge for Collins isn't just staying fit. As a paleontologist, he wants to look back in time. All the way back to more than 500 million years ago. By peering into the darkest recesses of animal history, Collins hopes to shed light on what has long remained a mystery. At Toronto's Royal Ontario Museum, Collins works with a vast repository of fragments from the ancient past. Fragments that reveal a world unknown until recently. We have a much better one over here. There's the, 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 the claw, the large predator. Oh, yeah. It shows up much better. Yeah, that's These the, fossils uh, from high in the Canadian Rockies form pieces in a puzzle that tell the story of early life on Earth. Yeah, that looks great. Thank you. Okay, good. good. The locality I work with is what's called the Burgess Shale. It's, it's a very famous locality uh, known since it was first discovered about 1909. The numbers of fossils are in the tens of, of thousands. The first person that, that collected the famous locality out west uh, in Western Canada around the turn of the century, he collected something like 65,000 specimens in five seasons. Strange, almost unearthly creatures were discovered in the Burgess Shale. They existed over half a billion years ago during the Cambrian period, eight times earlier than the last days of the dinosaurs. 
But more astonishing than their antiquity was the way these bizarre animals appeared, as if all at once, suddenly coursing through the world's oceans. Evidence of this unique event is not isolated to the Canadian Rockies. Similar sites have been uncovered all over the world. This extraordinary burst of animal life was dubbed the Cambrian Explosion. Few fossils reveal an entire animal, so scientists must try to recreate ancient creatures piece by piece. You just never know what you're going to find. The excitement is finding something completely different. And you say, gee whiz, look at that. I've, you know, I've never seen anything like that. But perhaps even more exciting, at least more exciting to me, is finding something that I'm looking for. I know I have some pieces of something, sort of like a piece of a puzzle. So I, I know there's an animal out there which has this particular structure or looks a certain way. I want to find the animal all put together. Uh, but I, I remember those moments vividly when you get something and it's never quite what you expect, but it's sort of it's the last piece of the puzzle. So this shows you the, the, the claws, which are... Uh... We track it again. It often takes side. years and several false starts to piece a single creature together from various fossils. It's a tricky process of trial and error, as Collins found with a predator called Anomalocaris. Here you can see the eyes on stalk. You can see the, the tail, six parts of the, of the tail here. Now, Anomalocaris was first described over 100 years ago in 1887. Uh, the original anomaly caris was based upon this particular claw. It looked like a shrimp body. It always seemed to lack a head, but it had what appeared to be legs on it. While some mistook a claw for an ancient shrimp, others were equally misled. Because of its circular markings, they labeled this specimen an extinct jellyfish. When further evidence came to light, both theories were shown to be wildly off base. What some had considered separate animals proved to be two parts of a single creature, Anomalocaris. What we thought were the body of a shrimp was actually claws, and what was thought to be a jellyfish was actually the, the jaws of this much, much stranger animal. This 1942 National Geographic magazine illustration shows how scientists had incorrectly imagined Anomalocaris. Paleontologists may rely on fossils, but few theories are solid enough to be written in stone. And then we've since collected a complete uh, specimen of Anomalocaris. The, uh, the claws coming here. The jaws don't show because you're looking under, on, the, on the underside of this. But you can see the whole animal here with swimming flaps and this very distinctive tail uh, at the bases. So we now have a pretty good idea. We've got the tail, we've got the head of what Anomalocaris looks like. And here we have a, a nice model uh, of the whole animal. This is the major predator from the, uh, from the main Burgess Shale site. There is the, is the jellyfish jaws. Well, obviously, it's not a jellyfish. These are the, the shrimp body, which are the claws. And if you look at that, compared to the actual claw we have here, this is, this is, not, this is life size. So these things got as big as this. And we even have claws which are twice this size. So it's conceivable that Anomalocaris got to up to a, a three or four feet in, uh, in length. So this was a major predator compared to all the other animals of that particular time. It took uh, over a hundred years to work out what this animal looked like from the first piece that we had. And all those scientists who worked with this stuff for a hundred years, they all had it wrong. So of course that makes me very nervous that, that uh, when I'm working with this stuff, particularly I have something which seems to be a piece of something, since I cannot relate it to something that's alive today, when I try to put it together, the chances are I'm going to be wrong. It's sort of a bit like pin the tail on the donkey, except you don't know if it's a tail, if it's a donkey, or which end is which anyway. What may be most astounding about the Cambrian explosion's fossil record is what we can see mirrored in it. Today, almost every creature on Earth can be traced back to the animals that left these imprints. Even though the species that appeared during the Cambrian explosion are extinct, some animals today bear an uncanny resemblance to them. This was Ashea, a carnivorous worm that first appeared over 500 million years ago. It's almost a double for the modern-day velvet worm, 
a predatory animal found in damp leaf litter and moist undergrowth of the Australian forests. Could this animal be the direct descendant of an Ashea that lived half a billion years ago? Other creatures also seem to have sprung straight from the past. One group of Cambrian fossils looks strikingly like modern comb jellies. Comb jellies and their Cambrian ancestors share a trait unique in all the animal kingdom, living paddles. Made of short strands called cilia, they propel the comb jellies gracefully through the water, turning movement into a breathtaking light show. Of course, nothing remotely resembling an elephant existed 500 million years ago. But the basic blueprints for these magnificent creatures were also being sketched back then. The elephant's basic design, its muscle segments, skeleton, brain and spinal cord, were represented in the tiny Pykeia. It's hard to imagine a creature any more different from an elephant. Pykeia swam the oceans and measured only a few inches. But this ancient body plan would be passed down to fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. Even elephants would descend from this ancient design. One of the amazing things about the animal kingdom, right from the Cambrian on, is that there's only about 35 body plans, basic designs, yet there are millions of species. Millions of species today, millions of species at any slice of time in the past. And they represent everything, everything from insects to whales, animals that live in water, animals that burrow underground, animals that live in coral reefs, animals that swim in the ocean, animals that live on the Antarctic ice, all of these species based on these 35 body plans. It was as if nature somehow struck upon life's essential designs in a single evolutionary leap. Every new shape of life that followed has been a variation on one of these themes. New body plans were only the beginning. As animals grew bigger and more complex, they ushered elaborate new behaviors onto the stage of life. From fierce territorial battles, to life and death struggles, epic migrations, even cooperation. Behaviors we take for granted today all took root in the Cambrian. The Cambrian legacy means that every animal on Earth has a colorful history waiting to be brought to light. On the trail of that ancient past, scientists are investigating the lives of the familiar as well as the mysterious and the wondrous. They're discovering that some of the most dramatic stories belong to the unassuming and benign creatures that emerged from the Cambrian explosion only to become unlikely heroes. Among them is an unappreciated group that shaped the destiny of the planet itself.
Biologist Downit McHugh studies animals that few of us even notice, yet life on Earth would be very different without them. I'm really fascinated by a group of creatures that most people might feel a little bit squeamish about. Some even find them a little bit repulsive. It's a group of animals that are probably underappreciated for their great diversity and also underappreciated in the role they play in the ecology of the planet. McHugh has devoted her working life to a group of animals called annelids. To most of us, they are known more simply as worms. You all set? Yep. I think so. Great stuff. Well, let's get going. Okay. All right. right. For no one. I just have to light a lantern back here. Why don't you do that? I'll get my gear from the Okay. Car. Okay. Ready? Yep. Studying annelids in their natural habitat sometimes means getting up early and going to places most people would rather avoid. Can you get the cooler, Gabe? Yeah, I can get it. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. All righty. Yeah. Beautiful morning. Yeah. Well, let's get going because the tide is not going to wait for us. What I like doing the most is actually getting out, getting down, getting dirty in the mud with the worms themselves. Getting out there, whether it's pouring rain, whether it's a low tide at dawn, I don't care. I just like to be out there with the worms, seeing them in their own habitat, getting to know them, understanding how they live, with what other creatures they interact, uh, how abundant they are. McHugh is enamored of worms the way other naturalists love birds or wildflowers. To her students, this enthusiasm is contagious. I think it's very easy to get people excited about worms if they can uh, appreciate the diversity, the color, the different lifestyles, the different ways that worms feed. But it, it's not often that people get a chance to do that. Anyone bold enough to make worm watching a hobby would be dazzled by the sheer diversity of annelids. Scientists have identified more than 15,000 species. From a cue, each is uniquely striking and beautiful. to color to their body and the worms move in a shimmying like fashion they have so many different forms that are graceful that are bizarre that bizarre feature I find quite fascinating I find their diversity to be really astonishing Equally astonishing from McHugh is the way that annelids have colonized the world. Annelids have adapted to many different habitats. The mud, hard rocky substrates, the deep sea, uh, the intertidal. Worms have mastered their habitat in many ways. In the most surprising places, wherever there seems to be a chance for life, worms have thrived. This sea star is a predator that lurks on the ocean bottom. But it also provides a safe haven for an enterprising creature. Tucked in among the sea star's tube feet, an uninvited guest has taken up residence.
This scale worm survives and flourishes by hitching a ride on the underside of the sea star and scrounging morsels from its meals. Other worms have built homes in far more hostile environments. Deep on the ocean floor, far from the sun's energy, these giant tube worms bathe in noxious chemicals that spew from underwater hot vents. Their scarlet gills are flush with blood that ferries chemicals to bacteria living inside their bodies. This unlikely partnership allows the worms to grow more than three feet in a year. The discovery of these hardy giants in the 1970s sent shockwaves through the scientific world. The size and the uh, abundance of these worms is, is very impressive. And also, the fact that they can survive in these really harsh habitats and somehow also get around from one hot vent to another hot vent island on the ocean, how they migrate or disperse among those habitats. Um, all of these things really got me hooked on the great tenacity of annelids and their importance in ecosystems, even unusual and unique ecosystems like the deep sea hot vents. Adapting to almost every environment on Earth, Worms have evolved in amazing ways. What appears to be a flower is actually the head of a worm. While the rest remains hidden below, the head blooms, filtering food from the water above. The aptly named feather duster worm has also evolved elaborate survival tools. Each of these dazzling appendages is equipped with tiny eyes for detecting danger. Of all the worms that reside in the sea, one of the most fascinating is the terabellid. My favorite worms are the terabellid annelids, and they live in tubes. And all you ever see is the opening of the tube at the surface of the mud. They're called spaghetti worms because they have these long, thin, white, extendable tentacles that go out over the mud surface, and these tentacles are grooved. They pick up particles in their tentacles, move the particles to the mouth, and there at the mouth they'll sort those particles according to size. Some will be used to build up their tube, most of them are used as food for the worm. So all you ever see of this worm, usually, are the, the white, extendable tentacles that look like spaghetti on the ocean floor. And sometimes you might see a frilly, bright red bush of, of gills that they use for respiratory functions. While annelids can be beautiful and bizarre, some lead what many would consider a horrific existence. Looking benign enough, this lithe creature is a specialist. It feeds on blood. This worm is a leech. Leeches. <laughs> That's a group of animals that not everybody is fond of, let's say. It's because they're notorious for their blood-sucking ability. Stealing through the water, these leeches scour ponds and marshes in search of their next meal. They are the masters of stealth, hunting with bloodthirsty efficiency. Sometimes, hapless victims come to them, making for easy prey.
Creeping around its victim without being detected, the leech probes for a soft, blood-rich spot to latch onto. Leeches have even developed the means to mask their ferocious bite. The bloodsuckers have an anesthetic that they inject into their victims that allows them to suck the blood without being noticed. That's a very effective way of feeding. This leech is equipped with three saw-like jaws that tear into flesh, enabling it to gorge itself, sometimes taking in 10 times its own body weight in blood. Given time, the once graceful leech becomes so engorged it can barely even crawl away. It can now go several months without another feeding. Yet for all the fear they evoke in us, some leeches make excellent parents. This one is brooding a litter of over 20 offspring, nestled in a special underside patch. While some annelids provide shelter for their young, others are expert home builders. Okay, folks, let's leave our stuff here, the lamp, lanterns, and the cooler. We can bring the shovels and buckets down to one flat. With the sun barely over the horizon, McHugh and her students arrive at a worm's paradise, the Oregon coast. Should be a good trip. Low tide in this bay exposes a vast mud flat, the ideal home for many marine worms. Well, there are small squiggles of, there'll be gray mud because the worms are digging up mud from, or, or, or eating mud from below the surface. Marine worms, like all annelids, greatly influence the communities in which they dwell. As hunters and scavengers, but also as highly innovative builders, they help to shape the very structure of the ecosystem. One of the most accomplished builders in mud flats like this is a worm called Diopetra. The muddy bottom of the estuary is honeycombed with their countless homes. Now, tube-dwelling worms can be present in great abundance. You can have many thousands per meter squared of tiny tube-dwelling worms that will, as I say, stabilize the mud habitat itself. By doing so, tube-dwellers actually provide a more permanent, stable habitat for other organisms. Diopatra's tubes act like roots to hold together sediment that would otherwise shift. The way they construct their tubes is nothing short of miraculous. Each builder secretes a glue-like compound from glands behind its head. Bound together, particles of sand, bits of shell and algae make a sturdy and deceptively simple home. From the safety of its tube, the worm reaches out to feed. Here, it devours a piece of seaweed. 
When the tide recedes, the worms retreat to the safety of their hardy shelters. The elusive worm that McHugh and her students seek this day is not a tube dweller. Okay, eyes peeled. We should find them very quickly because they're very abundant at this site. Instead of building, it tunnels. Over the eons, worms like these have endlessly churned the earth, becoming unlikely heroes in the process. I mean, they can be patchy, so we won't necessarily see them right away, but... Oh, there's one. Hey, Ooh. good job. And look, there's another one right beside us. Yes, that's a lovely example. Countlessly eating, tunneling, and producing waste, worms like the ones McHugh studies may have helped to save the planet from an age of ice. Let's have a go. We'll go straight down just a few inches from the burrow. And with a bit of luck, the burrow will just split open nicely when we go back the shots. There we go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, not splitting right on the burrow, but we might have them anyway. Any sign of the worm? Yeah, I see. Oh, perfect. There he is. Yes. Perfect. He'll be okay. Pay dirt. This modest-looking creature, a burrowing marine worm called Aberinicola, makes a most ordinary-looking prize. Good stuff. But when they first appeared, worms like Aberinicola marked a dramatic turning point for all animal life. They helped pioneer a new realm, a place where few other creatures had ventured. During the Cambrian period, competition was fierce throughout the oceans, but a frontier still remained. Few animals had burrowed deep into the sediment and taken up residence in the earth below. Some animals used the seafloor as a place to anchor. Others, like Pikea, swam through the waters above. Early worms, like Canadia, were lowly bottom feeders walking across the surface of the sediment. But the annelid body plan would soon produce pioneers. The annelid design is elegant in its simple efficiency. Flexible, segmented body along with a set of powerful muscles. A gut that runs from head to tail. A sophisticated nervous system. And a pulsing circulatory system. This was a creature capable of burrowing deep into the sediment. These animals may not have been the very first to break ground beneath the ocean floor, but when they did, they unquestionably mastered the art of digging. All modern diggers inherited their ability to tunnel from their Cambrian ancestors. But the worm is pumping water through the burrow. To help bore through soil and sediment, Aberinicola has another weapon in its arsenal, a powerful proboscis. Wait, I love watching them. Yeah, <laughs> looks like it's winding up. Yeah. There. There. there we go. Nice. Yeah. Aberinicola is like a living machine as it pushes its way into the underworld. Its body is uniquely adapted to the life of a miner. Like many of its annelid kin, Aberinicola sports frilly gills for breathing. Coordinating its sophisticated muscular system along a segmented body 
It produces powerful contractions that propel it deeper into the sediment. There's nothing momentous in the tunneling of worms until you measure their collective impact on the planet. Without worms, the Earth might be a very different place and a less hospitable one. Before the Cambrian explosion, Earth endured long periods of snow and ice. At times, the planet's surface was locked in a frozen crust half a mile thick. Then, as if by miracle, the final ice age lost its grip. Earth never again succumbed to a global ice age. The humble worm was a protagonist in this drama, a hero that helped to change the world. It's a story that began billions of years ago. Ever since life took hold in the oceans, the waste of living organisms and the decaying bodies of those that died have drifted to the seafloor. As this material accumulated, rich nutrients became trapped in the sediment. When annelids and other animals burrowed, they greatly sped up the recycling of this precious resource, turning carbon into carbon dioxide. The gas drifted up into the atmosphere. There, it fortified a protective blanket around the Earth, helping to trap the sun's heat. The result was revolutionary, a more stable, hospitable planet for life. Since the time of the, the explosion of animal forms, and since this apparent impact of burrowing and release of carbon dioxide and release from this snowball Earth, this global ice age, we have not seen an ice age of that immense coverage since. So we have not seen a, a global ice age since that time. Just as marine annelids may have altered the climate, Modern worms on land have had their own profound effect on the planet. Just down the hill here that I'd like to try. Yeah, it looks dark, rich, moist soil, well turned over by the worms. See it just over there? Today, McHugh leads another search, this time for Lumbricus, more commonly known as the garden earthworm. I think this would be a good spot. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. Here, get right on to me. They're nature's most talented gardeners. Wherever they're found, plants thrive. They do burrow deep if the soil is dry. They can burrow actually quite a ways down. Oh, this one. Oh, there we go. Can you hear it? There he is. The earthworms burrow through the soil, ingesting the soil. That's their food source. It's a big one. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah. They process that food and defecate it out the other end, the posterior end. In doing so, the earthworms, in burrowing through the sediment, aerate the soil to a great degree. That is, they bring oxygen down below the surface of the soil through their burrows. Earthworms can live up to seven years, and some species reach 20 feet in length. Their simple cylindrical bodies can push, pull, and slide themselves into any nook and cranny. With each powerful movement, they industriously burrow deep into the earth. Earthworms never seem to rest. If all the topsoil they have ever turned over was mounded up, it would cover Earth's land mass in a layer 300 miles deep, nearly 50 times the height of Mount Everest. 
In their burrowing, they alter the nutrients cycling in their habitat. A lot of the nutrients are trapped in debris on the surface of the sediment or the soil. The earthworms bring down this leaf debris by cycling the leaf debris through their gut. They release a lot of nutrients in that food source to other organisms in the soil. They really accelerate the whole decaying process of the leaves by processing it through their one-way gut. From the soil to the climate, annelids have contributed to the greening and blossoming of Earth, sustaining and nourishing life, forever leaving their subtle but vital mark on every facet of this magnificent planet. Mm -hmm.